in my personal opinion, I still don't understand why we are approaching uh, one size for all fee towards China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. It's clearly uh, driving them towards each other, right? And that's a profound uh, challenge would be potentially for our national security interests. Can we fight China and Russia at the same time? Or even Russia and Iran, if I was the king of the day, I would make sure that those adversaries are split. The country, as we know today, Iran, that's how it's pronounced because um, I've heard many different pronunciations. I've heard Iran, Iran, but the correct pronunciation is Iran. And then oftentimes also there's a confusion between Iran and Persia. Until 1935, the country was called Persia, but during the previous uh, kingdom, Pahlavi's kingdom, uh, the Shah's father, Reza Shah, changed the country's name to Iran which is, has a, a historical significance back uh, to the Persian and the first three Persian empires, uh, Achaemenians, uh, during the Ardashir uh, 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 kingdom that the, the name Iran was used. So uh, that's where the name coming from, uh, which means uh, land of Aryans. It's important for the U.S. Army, for the people, the members of the U.S. Army, to be aware of the background of Persia or Iran because the Iranians are. They have a very ancient civilization going back into the sort of prehistoric times. And most Iranians, whether they think in terms of their historical legacy or not, they live that historical legacy. The importance of their Persian cultural uh, heritage is more towards their, or is geared more towards how they how they see themselves within the region uh, specifically you know they have a historical legitimacy uh, within the region and that's really where they fall back on that persian heritage uh, now that has gone back and forth empires have risen and fallen since then with the introduction of islam and specifically shia islam and then you know their shia revolution they see themselves more as muslims than if you you know, we'll go back and look at their Persian heritage. But that is important for them to validate how they see themselves working within the region. Iranians, under some relatively ineffective rulers, the last of the uh, pre-Pahlavi, the, the Qajars, um, did their best to modernize the country, were not having very much success. The Qajars invited the Russians, the Tsarist Russians, to help them with their uh, military and their security situation in a way sort of like a country inviting the U.S. to send in trainers. And the Russians sent in essentially a bunch of Cossacks, uh, became a, the Cossack Brigade, which provided security for Iran. Over time, the Cossack Brigade began to bring Iranians in as junior officers, one of whom became a colonel in the brigade. His name was Reza Khan Pahlavi. He eventually overthrew the, the last of the Qajar Shahs, wanted to declare himself president of the Republic of Iran in the model of uh, Ataturk, 
But the clerics pushed back, and the clerics had enough authority, influence, that he decided it was much better for him politically to declare himself Shah, and he became Reza Shah Pahlavi. After that, I would emphasize uh, a major significant uh, highlight uh, is that World War II, World War II, because there was a suspicion that Iran could be part of the Axis. The Russians, the Soviets at that time, were very much interested in maintaining the lifeline that was the north-south rail and road corridor from uh, the Persian, northern end of the Persian Gulf up through Azerbaijan. The uh, British and the Russians decided that in order to ensure that this lifeline for lend-lease stuff, coming from the United States primarily, uh, may be maintained, uh, they needed to control the terrain. So the British invaded primarily from Iraq, the Russians invaded from the north and essentially seized this land corridor from the Persian Gulf northward. Uh, American engineers were assistants uh, provided engineering assistance to rebuild the port facilities, rebuild the roads, the rails, and uh, maintain this lifeline to the Soviet Union from 1941 through uh, the end of the war. Reza Shah Pahlavi, feeling that this was in, an infringement on Iranian sovereignty, was, let's just say, politely asked to abdicate in favor of Mohammad Reza, who was his son which he did. Uh, so Mohammad Reza Pahlavi became the Shah in 1941 and maintained this relationship with the British and the Russians until the end of the war. The war in Europe ends with the Allies victorious. The Americans, the engineers, and the British almost immediately evacuated the uh, areas that they had controlled. Uh, the Russians did not. The Russians uh, attempted to set up an independent quasi-independent, let's say, republic in the northern part of Iran. The seriousness with which the people all over the world, as well as the people of Iran, regard this state of affairs is testimony to the fact that delay in the settlement of this dispute is a threat to world peace. And they were there until 1946, when the UN finally got around to saying, hey, bug off, which they did. Uh, so. There is no love lost culturally, historically, between the uh, Iranian and the, uh, and the Russian people. 1951, Iranian parliament uh, voted to nationalize Iranian oil and natural gas industry. Abaddon, the world's largest oil refinery, which British enterprise and money built, may pass out of British control if Persia carries out the vote for nationalization passed by their parliament. At that time, the so-called Anglo-Iranian uh, oil company uh, was controlling the oil industry. And of course, that uh, led to the frustration by the, uh, by the Britain that they could lose their investments and control of the industry. Mr. Ambassador, this interesting uh, old gentleman, uh, Mr. Mossadegh is now a visitor in the United States. Do you know him personally, sir? Yes, extremely well. Uh, is he an able and responsible statesman? He's extremely able. He's a patriot. I think he's misguided in the way he's carrying out the nationalization program. I've told him that a number of times. And I've told him that as a friend of Iran, because I think a failure of this uh, uh, program of his may be very harmful to his country and a failure to make some kind of an agreement with responsible management, some responsible management company to operate, because I, I doubt that the Iranians themselves can operate this industry. Uh, just how important this matter is to the American people. Now, what is the oil potential in the Middle, in the, in the Middle East, for instance, sir? How can you illustrate the importance of this for Americans? Iran itself produces about 6% of the world production of oil products. It has uh, reserves, in terms of, of world reserves, of about 17%. The rest of the area around the Persian Gulf has reserves of about 
percent of the world's known reserve. In other words, almost half of the world's known Sorry. reserve is in this area. Yes, and consequently it's of vital importance for the future. Uh, in any terms you may think of, in industrialization, warfare, whatever you may. But in the public uh, mind, uh, Ambassador Grady, it seems to me that uh, the biggest fear that we have in this country is the intrusion of Russia into this picture. As a result, there were other factors, other reasons, but that was the main, one of the main factors why it's known uh, widely that the U.S. and British intelligence services staged a coup and the government of Prime Minister Mohammed Mossadegh was overthrown. The relationship between the U.S. and the, uh, the Shah of Iran was a positive relationship in the U.S. eyes. Um, they were a backstop during that time the Cold War was going on, having influence uh, with, with the regional power you know, that, that we saw at that point, and oil-rich power as well, having that influence with them in order to mitigate any sort of Soviet influence um, at the time was very important to us. And you look back, it just if you Google pictures of the Shah, he is almost always in a military uniform. He's got his, his ribbons, his sash, all that, the, you know, the whole, whole thing. He's always decked out in his military uniform. The Shah loved his military. And it was a, a focal point of his westernization, modernization effort. Now, looking at it as dispassionately as possible, I think uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, had the best, what he saw as the best interests of his country at heart. He wanted to improve the economy. He wanted to improve the education for people outside of the cities. He wanted to incorporate the best that he saw of Western technology. He established what came to be called the White Revolution in order to achieve this, but it was top-down driven. It didn't look at what people at the bottom of the economic heap really needed or wanted, but it did say, hey, we know what's best for you, very paternalistic, we're going to do this for you. This, of course, from the popular perspective, came across as very heavy-handed. And one of the challenges, at least from my perspective, was that these multiple clerics throughout the country were not brought in to help make decisions, locally or nationally. And the influence of these clerics at the lower levels began to develop a, uh, call it a counterlash, if you wish, which moving us forward into the latter years of the 60s is where Ayatollah Khomeini began to develop a following. He was a charismatic leader, a very effective speaker, and began to amass a following of folks who would listen to his sermons. And when he said, the Shah is undermining our traditions, the Shah is not being a good Iranian Muslim, um, began to get a lot of attention, uh, so much so that the Shah eventually had him expelled from the country. So there was a clash between the two tendencies in these traditional Muslim countries, the so-called uh, traditionalists or conservatives and liberals or reformists. Comes the 1970s and the Shah is facing this unrest this lower level unrest. Uh, he, is, does his, he did his best throughout the early 70s to maintain control, <clears throat> but when uh, late, in the late 1970s, I think it was about 1976, it became apparent that he was not physically well. Turns out he had cancer, which eventually led to the situation when the Shah essentially gave up, um, fled the country. Khomeini returns to, returned to Tehran in, uh, in 1979 to great acclaim. Uh, we have won the revolution, says uh, all, say all the people chanting at the airport. I remember those images from the TV screens when the millions of Iranians were greeting him. 
with tears in their eyes, with, uh, with uh, crying, etc. That was a more uh, kind of natural emotion at the time, at the time, in that geopolitical situation. Shortly after that, the referendum was conducted and constitution was adopted per the Sharia and Islamic law fiqh. Now, the, the government structures were established. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini became the very first supreme leader, the so-called kind of highest clerical leader who essentially controls everything. After the revolution, the regime was also successful to bring the Shia, uh, uh, I guess, ideology back to the countries. Khomeini solidified his control uh, in a variety of ways sort of in some ways very bloodily because uh, any of the royalist officers from the military, any of the politicians who were perceived to be royalists at heart, well, they found themselves to be in, let's say, dire straits. Some were uh, imprisoned, some were exiled, and many were probably executed. Beginning of revolution, my dad was a hematologist and an artist. Yeah, he was a political prisoner for almost five years in uh, Evan prison and Ghazal Hassar uh, prison, tortured, things like that, and I used to go visit him there. And a few family members were executed. The government is a, was established, and over the first few months, the Iranian central government did what it could to mend relationships with Western countries, to the extent that the foreign minister uh, was entering into discussions with the United States government, for example, to reopen the U.S. embassy. Some of the more radical members of the, of the uh, revolutionary organizations did not take too kindly to this. The activists seized the U.S. embassy, which began the hostage crisis. Iran 1979, demonstrators invaded the American embassy in Tehran. Demanding the return of the Shah, they took embassy personnel as hostages in violation of international law. Treaty signed by the United States and Iran state that both countries will observe the principle of diplomatic immunity, a principle which protects foreign representatives and embassy property. All appeals to free the hostages were denied by the government of Iran. The refusal constituted an unprecedented breach of the rules of normal diplomatic behavior. Most of the Iranians who were working in the embassy were just told to go home. The Americans were held hostage for over a year, 444 days to be more exact. The American military um, launched a not well organized rescue attempt. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages who've been held captive there since November 4th. Equipment failure in the rescue helicopters made it necessary to end the mission. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. From an Iranian perspective, the fact that Americans could bring in aircraft and personnel, land in Iran, and launch this rescue attempt meant, from their perspective, that there's got to be American sympathizers still here in Tehran, still here in the military, and the uh, government used this as evidence to do another purge of the economic, social, and political leadership in which another group of moderates ended up um, losing their livelihoods, if not their lives. Upshot of this whole thing is that the neighbor to the west, Saddam Hussein, decided that this time was right for him to launch an incursion to his east 
to seize Iranian terrain abutting the Shat al-Arab, which is the waterway that comes from the Persian Gulf and leads up to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And so this is the beginning in 1980 of the Iran-Iraq War, which is another topic altogether. Uh, and oh, by the way, if you really want to get a little bit of a perspective on the devastation of the Iran-Iraq War, um, there are sources that would say that they lost half a million casualties or more um, in the early years of the war, but they overwhelmed the mechanized armored forces of Iraq just in sheer numbers. After 1991, the Gulf War, um, they really started changing their, their outlook when they saw what a technologically advanced military could be possible of doing, uh, especially to one of countries right next door. So Iran's government is a, it's a theocracy. So you have a supreme leader, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, right now. Now he is the commander in chief. He's the head of government. He controls everything, and he has the final say. Of course, after supreme leader, the highest executive uh, uh, role is uh, played by the president. Currently, the president is Ibrahim Raisi. The ideals of the Iranian revolution, the way the government was set up, echo very strongly of Western democratic traditions. There is an elected president. There is a parliament elected by the, by the vote of the, of the people. There is a government set of ministries that take care of the kinds of things that you would expect a government to do. There is a tradition of consultation that would lead you to think that this is moving in, in to, uh, into a more democratic view. The challenge, however, is that overlying this whole thing is the, the set of guardians, the guardian council, the, the consultative council, the, whoever the current supreme leader is, that are so deeply steeped in this revolutionary ideology as proclaimed by Ayatollah Khomeini, um, that there's, call it, if you wish, this gulf between what it p appears the population would like to see and what these, this guardian level is willing to accommodate. Amid the non-stop protests on Monday, the Iranian police resumed its warnings that women must wear mandatory headscarves in public even in their cars. Meanwhile, British media reports say that London might soon declare the Iran Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist group. This after it arrested seven people who were linked to the UK over anti-government protests. As per The Telegraph, the move will be announced in the coming weeks. If the Revolutionary Guard gets proscribed as a terror group, then it would become a criminal offence to belong to the group, attend its meetings or carry its logo in public. Iran is continually looking for ways to exert its influence on a broader scale than just in the particular area of the Gulf. The government of Iran submitted an application for BRICS membership. The Iranian Foreign Minister Zaid Qazizabjah informed that with their entry into the group, they will create an economic and commercial alliance of nations together with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. I think they're intention to become part of this conglomerate we call BRIC is part of that. If they can, if the Iranian government can be recognized as being a contributing member of this, this group of second level governments and um, economies, then it's all to their benefit. I would agree with that. Probably that could, could be called like the club of sanctioned. So the several countries increasingly um, partner, uh, uh, getting closer as partners, 
which historically be unfriendly to each other. But now they're getting closer to each other because uh, your adversary is my adversary and that's why we're friends. Ibrahim Raisi was welcomed to Beijing with a grand ceremony at the Great Hall of the People. It's the Iranian president's first visit to China and his second meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping since September. Xi says Iran is an old friend of China. Both sides are working to deepen ties in the face of growing tensions with the United States, although Beijing denies this is the reason for the visit. China is Iran's biggest trading partner and the only customer of its heavily sanctioned oil exports. U.S.-led sanctions have left Iran in its toughest economic situation in more than 40 years. Beijing has condemned the sanctions and Washington's withdrawal from a 2015 nuclear deal with Iran and several world powers. Xi Jinping says China will continue to take part in negotiations to get the agreement reinstated. I think we have to recognize that Iran, like every other country, doesn't do things that don't seem to support their national interests. So what is, what is Iran's interest in joining BRIC? Uh, diplomatic authority, economic connections, ability to evade some of the most egregious pieces of the sanctions, perhaps. Having a larger group speak in support of Iran's positions, uh, all would be diplomatically beneficial, I think. They don't like the fact that the current American government maintains sanctions that have devastated the Iranian economy. But they may do. National security strategy currently doesn't portray Iran as a near-peer competitor, not somewhere where we are going to focus our national efforts, our instruments of national power, uh, compared to the threat that we see with China as being a near-peer uh, competitor or, or even Russia um, as a maybe not as much of a near peer competitor as China, but definitely a um, a threat. So I think the importance of keeping the, you know seeing Iran as a threat versus a near peer is due to the instability that could cause to the region as a whole. If Iran were attacked um, from the outside, the Iranian army um, would stand fast, defend Iran to its last bullet, its last breath, probably very effectively. They proved that in the Iran-Iraq war. It took them eight years to go from being overwhelmed to being able to push the Iraqi army back into Iraq. I would argue that the Iranian military is the first and, and probably best example of what we now call hybrid warfare. And this, this is something that goes straight back to the aftermath of the revolution. It, and really, in, when they were fighting the Iraqi military, which was a very, very powerful and well-equipped conventional force, the Iranians had to come up with new solutions to, to um, fighting this a, a, a much more capable conventional force. And the result is what we now call hybrid warfare. Essentially, the Iranian military is made up of two major elements. Uh, the Artesh, which is the Iranian word for uh, army, is the, call them the conventional forces which would be the Iranian land forces, the Iranian naval forces, the Iranian air forces, the Iranian rocket forces. The 
these are the, the, the armor, the mechanized infantry folks whose focus is national defense. If Russia invaded, it would be the Artesh that would be fighting against the advancing uh, Russian military forces. The second group, you've, um, you know as the uh, Pasteran, or the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, is almost a mirror image, smaller, more ideologically focused than the Artesh. But the Pasteran, or the IRGC, has a land force, a maritime force, an aerospace component, and the Quds Force, which is their special forces. Our, you know, you have, have Artesh on one side, IRGC on the other. They both report to a single entity called the Armed Forces General Staff, which is the senior military element in Iran. That's the equivalent of their joint chiefs, basically. And then that organization reports directly to the Ayatollah and the, uh, the Guardian Council. So they, the, it's the, the Ayatollah and the Guardian Council are the, the commanders-in-chief, essentially. The general staff is the, the senior military staff, and then the two branches, of, or the two halves of the military um, continue to coexist, sometimes not very uh, friendly, like all the way up to the present day. The reason for that is uh, during the revolution, the, the conventional military, the Artesh, was very tended to be aligned very closely with the Shah. So these parallel efforts are, they continue, and the, the Iranian government is okay with this for the most part because it, it divides power, essentially. Due to that level of mistrust a little bit, or uncertainty, I should say, because there are very many trusted leaders still within the Artash, um, and they have proven themselves um, over the years, especially if you look back at the Iran-Iraq War uh, during the 80s, However, in that war, the IRGC was given the lead due to, you know, at the time, wanting to have a force in charge that the Supreme Leader felt uh, was committed to the cause, so to speak, and in line with all the concepts and, and ideologies of the revolution. When we look at the domestic disturbances, one of the um, structures of the IRGC is composed of local militia, uh, referred to as the besiege. And they are volunteers within all the towns and villages and, and big cities. They will get activated to help quell any sort of dissidents that, that might be ongoing. But originally the Basij was formed during the Eight Years' War between Iran and Iraq War. Uh, so that the idea of uh, mobilization came in uh, because um, it was at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, army was in distress because people left the country after the revolution, the leaders left the country, or they were ex executed by the regime. So, uh, so the Basij uh, or human wave was uh, formed to, uh, in battlefields uh, to confront, confront Saddam Hussein and uh, his army. I uh, had the opportunity to speak to an Iraqi officer who had served in the Iran-Iraq war as an artillery battery commander, in his words, not mine. It made him sick to his stomach to be slaughtering these preteen boys who were running at him in these massive human wave attacks. Looking outside of Iran's borders, you have the IRGC Quds Force. They're the ones that go and help train their partners and allies, other military units, export Iranian ideology, as well as conduct military operations outside of those borders. The IRGC, as, as it's developed, they've, they continue to have the same central role, which is defending, protecting the revolution. That, that hasn't really changed. But as they've grown, as they've expanded, their role in Iran's military doctrine has changed significantly. And... Primarily, it's, they've become the chief uh, architect of Iran's regional force projection strategy. It, it took a while, and it, it took significant resources to build them into this new entity that really isn't like anything else in the world. The Artesh's mission is a, a much more conventional military mission. And primarily, their concern is the defense of Iranian territorial integrity. 
and they are built for that mission. It's a, a ground-heavy force. This is true for both Artesh and the IRGC. They, uh, their command structure is unique. And when you look at it, the, it and I'll talk about the Artesh first, the, the way they've gone about it, they, they've divided Iran into five different what they call operational headquarters. The uh, IRGC does uh, essentially the, the same basic idea. Uh, they are divided into commands uh, that have essentially the same mission as the OHQs. The big difference between uh, Artesh operations and IRGC is an IRGC brigade has a much higher proportion of officers in it as compared to an Artesh brigade. And that is intentional. The, the reason for that is the... IRGC envisions its brigades as sort of shell like shell units and the so the brigade is set up to receive large numbers of militia units the Basij militia that is very localized you know down to the individual uh, town community level so I was born in Iran I moved to the United States when I was 17 and during my school years in Iran uh, there are always Basij in the schools in local mosques, and so they're able to recruit these uh, young individuals, try to, um, uh, I don't want to use the term brainwash, but introduce them to the Shia ideology and kind of uh, what the Nazi Germany was doing, and try to uh, use them, either offering them uh, some advantages to getting universities and uh, or subsidies in uh, getting uh, uh, monthly uh, stipends and things like that to recruit them. And these besieges are being used even right now today on the streets of Iran. As far as it limits on the size of um, militia units, they, they are arranged as battalions and it's hard it's that's pretty opaque for us in in the west to see how these are really organized because a lot of it's kind of informal it's it's not like a what we would think of when we think of our reserve component which is basically the same military structure just as on a part-time basis and this is actually reflected in the atp i think i have a diagram of a of a Basij unit, I, I think I say it's anywhere between three and X number of battalions and just have you know, the dashed lines around the battalions to indicate, hey, these may or may not be present in it. So it is, it's one of the characteristics of the Iranian military as a whole is a lack of, uh, of what we would call standardization. The Artesh is, the unit structure is more standardized, but for example, when it comes to equipment, it's all over the place. Even units within the same brigade do not necessarily operate the same pieces of equipment. And that's very strange for someone in the U.S. Army. We we have one kind of tank. We have one kind of uh, um, uh, IFV. We have uh, one kind of attack helicopter. The Iranian military, I'm sure they would like to be standardized, but the results of sanctions, the results of their inability to buy new weapons on the international market and limitations in their ability to produce stuff indigenously, it means that their formations have all kinds of different weapons. So Iran's military is, is equipped with uh, platforms acquired from multiple areas, not all uh, well, most of them not internally manufactured. If we look at platforms like their tanks, they are talking with Russia about potentially updating their fleet with uh, the T-90s uh, that Russia exports as well. Same goes when you look at their air power. They have a mix of airframes from bombers and fighters, um, even to the, um, the American F-14s um, that we had Agreed to provide them 80 F-14s uh, prior to the revolution. I think we delivered 79 of those. They just have to get creative and and use what they have on hand to, to fill out their formations. And um, in general, uh, readiness is a struggle, as one might imagine. Maintaining a 60-year-old tank is a 
significant task, let alone a, a helicopter or a, an aircraft. But um, they they seem comfortable with their this uh, this hybrid model and and uh, these ad hoc uh, unit designs. And it you know they sort of have to be because they don't necessarily have an alternative. It's mostly reverse engineering of different technology rather than new technology. They have made modifications to different uh, aspects of their military, such as missile programs or tanks, and uh, even uh, uh, with their aircraft, even though their aircraft are old, they were able to equip them with the more precision-guided uh, missiles. So the, um, the carrier might be F-4 Phantom that we have in museums today, but they were able to uh, modify those that they can uh, put, you know, guided missiles on them. They have put a lot of effort into extending the reach of their missiles. They have short-range, long-range ballistic missile capability. That has evolved now into one of the world's largest ballistic missile fleets. It, the the uh, unclassified numbers right now, I think, are over 3,000 missiles of all types in the Iranian inventory. And this is a way that they can affect uh, a kinetic action hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from Iranian borders without having to send soldiers, aircraft, ships, the you know, more conventional military forces. Now, if you look at some of their asymmetric capabilities, if you look at drones, um, for instance, those are a lot of things that they're manufacturing themselves and increasingly um, adding on to their capability and how they, re how they interact, are they able to swarm, what sort of payloads are they able to carry, um, et cetera. They're also looking at uh, capabilities in, in that matter if you look at unmanned uh, water drones or underwater drones as well um, versus focusing on, for instance, uh, building an aircraft carrier or something like that when it comes to their maritime security. Iranians excelled uh, through their proxies as well as uh, electronic warfare, cyber, jamming certain uh, signals, etc. That's what they excelled. In 2020, they were successfully able to um, uh, attack, uh, launch an attack against the Israelis' uh, water infrastructure. Israel's national cyber chief says the hacking attack against the country's water systems was aimed at disrupting key national infrastructure and warned of similar threats in the future. And during this recent election in the U.S., there were also uh, email campaign targeting certain candidates. On October 22, 2020, FBI and CISA publicly announced the Iranian campaign to intimidate and influence American voters and otherwise undermine voter confidence and create discord in the 2020 U.S. election process. So they are able to uh, use that uh, cyber capabilities and target uh, critical infrastructures, in infrastructures such as banking system, and uh, they can use that in the advantage as they need it. If they can attack any sort of opponent through through the, the cyber warfare uh, to stop them or to diminish their capability of impacting Iran, I think they'd see that as a success. How do I assess the Iranian military capabilities? Uh, more than adequate to defend the nation. I am 100% guilty of this. So I know that lots of my, my fellow military community is also, is thinking of Iran as being primitive or unsophisticated when it comes to their military. Now, it is absolutely true that their military is not very modern, that it's relatively poorly equipped, relatively poorly trained, et cetera. That, those things are all true. But their military thought is very sophisticated. It's something that I, in, in researching the ATP, I was um, struck by how uh, consistent their thoughts were on their doctrine and how uh, realistic they are in assessing their, uh, their strengths and their weaknesses 
in assessing their opponent's strengths and weaknesses and coming up with a, a coherent strategy that accounts for all of that stuff. And they have created a thoughtful strategy and a thoughtful approach to their application of military power that I think is lost on a lot of Western audiences. So Iran found ways to defeat a much more highly mechanized and armored military. Would they be able to do the same thing against a modern American force? The most important thing that, that I think the U.S. Army needs to understand about Iran and any potential conflict that it might be involved in is, um, is, is to expect or maybe not to expect a conventional uh, confrontation. Thank you.